Thank you, Avi. So, uh, as Avi said, this is an introductory uh, lecture on PCPs and uh, about the two games. But this is uh, really supposed to be a basic uh, lecture, so feel free to ask any question. Uh, so let's start. So let's uh, let us start with a definition. We define a problem known as label cover. Uh, so what do we have? We have a graph VE. So we can assume this graph is regular, everything that you, you like from it. We have a finite alphabet, sigma, and we have a set of constraints, one for each edge. Uh, no, <laughs> let's not do that. So, uh, yeah, but there is no reason to. So each constraint is simply a type of uh, a collection of uh, uh, pairs that we allow on the endpoints. So, so this is a the generalization of a Yeah. So we'll get to that. Uh, so what is the goal? The goal. To find an assignment to the vertices such that as many of the constraints are satisfied. Okay, so this is uh, the basic definition. Uh, so let's see some examples. Uh, so this is a, a, a wide variety of problems. You can uh, uh, think uh, w w about, uh, say, sigma equals 0, 1, alphabet of size 2. And there we have sort of a, a very uh, well-known example known as MaxCut. Uh, so how do we formulate MaxCut as a label cover? So recall that we have uh, some graph. And we want to partition the vertices into two parts so that as many edges ca uh, cross from one to the other side. So the way to label it, the way to formulate it as a label cover is to take sigma to be 0, 1. 0 would be the left side, 1 would be the, uh, the right side, and then uh, for every edge, the constraint is that the both endpoints get different values. Okay, and then you can easily check that the size of the cut really corresponds to the fraction of edges that are satisfied. Um, so this is sort of a very classical example. Uh, let's look at uh, maybe two more examples. Uh, second one is a coloring problem. Or maybe say K coloring. So how do we formulate it as a label cover? So we have our alphabet. 1 to k. Each symbol is supposed to represent one uh, color class. And then for each edge, the constraint is that uh, we get two different symbols for sigma. Yeah. Uh, but the, the reason I separated these two problems is that here our optimization is really about the fraction of satisfied edges. Here it's a little different. We want all edges to be satisfied. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit different, but still can be formulated as level cover. So it's, it's, uh, the goal may be different. The goal is yeah, not the goal to is optimize the fraction, but let's say satisfy all of them. Is yeah, so this is a different goal, but uh, usually, in this talk, we'll stick to this call. Uh, good. 
So, uh, so what can we say about level cover? Uh, so here is a task. Uh, I have some parameter delta less than one. Think of delta as constant. Now I give you a label cover instance, and I promised you that either you can satisfy all of the edges, or you can satisfy at most delta fraction of the edges. So phi is the set of constraints. Okay. Uh, so I promised you that it's either satisfiable or at most delta satisfiable, and ask you to tell me which one of these cases does it lie in. No? And of course, you need to do it efficiently. So uh, here we have the PCP theorem. Proven in the 90s. It says that uh, there exists some explicit constant less than one and a finite alphabet size k, such that uh, if I give you a label cover instance with alphabet size k, then this task is NP hard. And uh, the way uh, we usually write it is that gap label cover. between 1 and delta is NP hard. And I'll write here k to denote that we look at label cover of alphabet size k. Well, for people who have never ever seen this, this like, uh, was a major breakthrough in uh, the history of like, complexity theory. And it gave access of proving hardness of approximation results. And actually it was quite funny because the first paper that I cited here gave the application sort of to hardest approximation, but it, they still didn't know how to prove, say, things like that. But then with some more work, they managed to do that. Uh, yeah. But uh, the story really only begins here. So we have, yes. Um, are there examples, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, are there examples, sort of simple kind of combinatorial question type examples like max cutter, K cover, for which it de uh, a label cover interpretation doesn't work? What do you mean? So there are problems where you cannot, uh, well, there is no natural uh, formulation as label cover. So maybe largest cycle, largest simple cycle in the graph. Or well, isomorphism. Yeah, but uh, usually in this talk we'll stick to s to something uh, to label cover or also known as cons constraint satisfaction problems. Okay, uh, so as I said, the story really only begins with the PCP theorem because once you have uh, this type of theorem, you can ask yo yourself what can you prove with it? Can you prove maybe stronger versions? So uh, two questions that we'd like to ask ourselves are uh, the following. Uh, so we have this delta parameter in the theorem. This is called the soundness of the PCP. Uh, so one task is uh, get small soundness. So the first task is uh, to get smaller soundness. And the second task is to get a uh, more structured uh, PCP or label cover instances. And uh, what I mean by more structured is uh, maybe I can get some structure on these constraints. Right now, they are completely arbitrary. I would like to give them more structure so that they, that maybe allow me to 
more applications. Does that include k? Uh, k will be always a constant. It will be larger and larger as the stock goes on. Oh, so there's no like k equals two. So th there are certain limitations. So if k is equal to two, you cannot get uh, small soundness because for every edge, there would be at least one satisfying assignment out of four, right? It, 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 it. Sliding scale is for non-constant alphabets, uh, but that really goes in the first point here. Okay, so uh, we want to get smaller soundness. Uh, so let's uh, go to task number one. Uh, so how do we get smaller uh, soundness? Uh, so for that, let's uh, really pick uh, an active view of PCPs just for a moment. So a label cover has many, so you can view it from uh, many different perspectives. So one of them is where you have some verifier and prover and you want to verify something. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the following uh, very similar thing. So <laughs> we have a verifier. And the verifier is computationally bounded, and it wishes to know if a given label cover instance is highly satisfiable or not. And the way it does it is the following. So he has two provers. Uh, that are all powerful. He can ask them question, get an answer, and then decide either this thing is satisfiable or not, not very satisfiable. And the way it does it is the following. So it samples an edge, randomly from the graph, and sends one endpoint to the first prover, and the second endpoint to the second prover. And it expects to get the label of the vertex. So this is supposed to send him a labeling of the third vertex. This is supposed to send a labeling of the second vertex. And then the very fair checks if this is indeed satisfying the constraint. And if so, it accepts. OK. So here is something that is uh, easy to check. Uh, if, uh, the, if the instance is satisfiable, the provers can simply follow the assignment and always convince the verifier. Yeah. Uh, whereas if this instance is at most data satisfiable, then there is some chance, depending on delta, that they will fail. This is not too hard to prove, but uh, we'll not do it. Good. So we formulated the label cover as in this uh, two provers, one verifier game. And now we ask ourselves, OK, how can the verifier gain more confidence about if the instance is satisfiable or not? But he only wants to ask two provers. He doesn't want to introduce another prover. This is really about the query, the query complexity of the PCP, but never mind that. Okay. Uh, so, so what is the most natural idea? So why ask each prover only one question? Ask him many questions. And this is called the parallel repetition. So in now instead of sampling one edge, the very far samples many edges. Samples U1, uh, V1. To U R V R sends all of the U's to the first mover. All of the V's to the second mover. It's supposed to get answers.
And then it does the, the obvious thing. He accepts if all pair answers are accepting. Okay, so this is a parallel repetition. Uh, so here is a question. So if I tell you that the provers have a strategy that wins this game with probability one, then of course they have matching strategy here. They simply answer each coordinate independently. Uh, now here is uh, the second question. Uh, so suppose the provers win with probability less than one. Yeah, in this game. In this game, yeah. yeah. So the value of the yeah. So maybe call it really the value of the game. So the value of a game is the acceptance of the maximum acceptance probability of the verifier over all the strategies of the provers. So suppose the value of the basic game is bounded away from one, at least some at most some delta. Uh, what can we say about the value of the repeated game? So obviously it's uh, at most delta to the R, right? Uh, so no. Uh, this is not, and this is actually a very famous uh, mistake. The people who thought about it said, okay, this is a theorem, proof by definitions or immediate or something like that. Uh, but still something along these lines holds. So this is uh, the power repetition of uh, Ran Raz. It says that the, the value of the game uh, indeed goes down exponentially but uh, not with delta, with something else. That depends on uh, many things. It depends on delta, it depends on the alphabet size, but we think about, for, for simplicity, we only think that it depends on delta. So the value indeed goes down exponentially fast, <coughs> but net maybe not as you would hope, but this is still good. Yeah, it's uh, it's for general games. It's tight. It's a uh, it's, uh, it's the story about power repetition still didn't finish. We were as proof maybe only began. So by now we have maybe four more proofs. <laughs> we have some examples where it's tight, where it's not tight. Relation to geometry, tiling. <laughs> but this is a separate lecture. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So I think that C of delta is. So the original proof gave something very funny, like uh, one minus delta to the sixty or whatever something. So th the sixty has been improved since to maybe three or two in some cases. But uh, th the point is that it's strictly less than one if you think of delta as constant. Good. Uh, so now that we have uh, this uh, PCP theorem, and we have uh, Raz's parallel repetition theorem, uh, we can state PCP plus uh, parallel repetition. It says that uh, for every delta greater than zero, there is some alphabet size k. Oh, by the way, maybe this is a good point. So what happens to the alphabet size when we do this thing? Yeah, so you see, now instead of answering one symbol, they, they need to answer R tuple of symbols, so it's sigma to the R. So this also goes up. Uh, so PCP plus parallel petition says that for every delta greater than zero, there exists some K, such that a uh, gap uh, label cover 
value of both sides k between 1 and delta is NPR. So if you if you look at it uh, from the graph point of view, this is really the strong product that you mentioned mentioned a few weeks ago. Uh, good. Uh, so why do we care about this thing? Uh, so th the point is that once you have small soundness, you can prove many tight in approximability results. Uh, maybe not as many as we would wish, but let's see some of them. Uh, so. Uh, Okay, so uh, I'm going to state now uh, two results, both of them according to Johan Hastad, actually from the same paper. Uh, so let's start with the well-known example of 3SAT. Uh, so we have a formula, a CNA formula. Uh, over uh, 0, 1 to the n, and we wish to satisfy as many clauses as possible. Okay, uh, so here is a basic claim. Whenever I have uh, such formula, I can always satisfy at least 7 over 8 of the clauses. Okay, this is uh, something very uh, classical, very easy. And the, the best way to see that is, suppose we uh, choose an assignment at random for the variables. What is the probability that this clause is satisfied? Well, what is the probability that it's not satisfied? So x1 would have to get the value 0, x3 would have to get the value 1, and x9 would have to get the value 0. So it's 1 over 8. So you get an expectation, 7 over 8 of a clause that are satisfied, and you can even de-randomize it. It's not uh, too bad. Good. So can we do better than 7 over 8? So this, is, this gives you a 7 over 8 approximation because clearly <laughs> you cannot satisfy more than all of the constraints. Uh, so can we do 7 over 8 plus epsilon? So no, Hastert said us that we can't. So his theorem says that for every epsilon greater than 0, a gap 3 sat between 1 and 7 over 8 plus epsilon is np hard. So in particular, I give you a 3SAT formula. I promise you it's either satisfiable or at most barely uh, larger than 7 over 8. Then this is hard to distinguish uh, between these two cases. No, so for out, so you can ask this question when epsilon depends on n, but then you need a different PCP theorem. So this is a PCP theorem by uh, Moskowitz and Raz, but we'll not talk about it uh, today.
Uh, so the second result of Hasser that I'd like to talk about is about linear equations. So the problem is as follows. We have a set of variables x1 to xn getting 0, 1 valued or uh, values from f2. And we have a set of equations. Each equation is of the form variable plus variable plus maybe another variable is equal to some number between uh, some 0 or 1 and over f2. Okay. And uh, again here, the task, I give you this instance and I ask you to find an assignment that satisfies as many equations as possible. So here we have two things that are easy. So if I give you any system, you can always satisfy at least half of the equations. So why, again, the trick is, uh, again, you randomize, you choose an assignment at random, you look at each equation, and you can satisfy it with probability half. Good. Uh, so what about the second case? Now, suppose I give you such system, and I promise you that it's satisfiable. What can you do in this case? You can solve it, right? It's a linear system. Uh, but the question is, what happens in the middle? What happens if I only promise you 99% satisfiability? So here, Hastad uh, strikes again, and uh, he proves that for every epsilon greater than zero, a uh, gap lean between one minus epsilon, this is 99%, and half plus epsilon is npr. Yeah, especially in this talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in some sense, this result is more important to us than uh, the first result result because we start our reduction from it, but this is really something fundamental about linear equations. And uh, if you care about uh, linear equations mod Q, you, you have an obvious extension of this theorem there. Okay, so any questions? Three variables, yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, so for these problems, we got an, uh, a tight approx in approximability result. Let's talk about problems where we don't have such tight in approximability result. Uh, so other problems. Uh, so let's talk about the vertex cover problem. So, uh, we have a graph v equals v. Uh, so, we want to, se to find a set of vertices uh, C uh, that touches. Every edge. Okay. Uh, so, what can you say about this problem? Uh, so, this is an NPR problem. It's NPR to find the minimal vertex cover, or the minimum. I always confuse these uh, two terms. I mean the smallest vertex cover. So, what, what about approximation? Uh, 
Uh, so it's very easy to find a vertex cover that is at most twice as much as the minimal. Uh, and the way to do that is you pick an edge at each time, you put both vertices into C, and then remove all edges that touch at least one of these vertices. Then you can uh, clearly see that this is a two approximation. And remarkably, this is kind of the best algorithm that we know, at least if you don't care about uh, lower order terms. Uh, so there are uh, two minus little o of uh, the degree uh, approximation algorithms uh, by Halperin. But uh, for us, we don't think about uh, the degree is bounded. It can be, it can be growing with n. Uh, good. So what about harness? Uh, so if you use this theorem, you can do in a really elementary way, you can show that 7 over 6 uh, minus a little bit is hard. Uh, this is also due to Hastad. And uh, to get past this 7 over 6 is not uh, that easy. And uh, the first people who did that are uh, Ridino and uh, Muli Safra. So they got some precise number, which I don't remember, but uh, it's something like 1.36. Uh, it's a algebraic number. It has a simple reason in the sense that I, so I teach this when I, t when I was a TA in complexity, I taught it in undergrad uh, complexity, but like this reduction. reduction. It's a very simple reduction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this reduction is not simple. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not simple. Uh, so I, I cannot teach it to undergrad students. <laughs> and, uh, And this is a, so this was proved in uh, 2002, and wasn't improved until uh, very recently. So we'll get to the improvement, but this is sort of, a, at least for us, it's the, the state of the art for now. Um, uh, another m notable problem is the max cut problem. So where we have a very nice approximation algorithm. Uh, by Gomez and Williamson. Yeah, I, I always confuse it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so they have a very nice approximation algorithm using SDP, using some indefinite programming uh, to some factor. I don't remember what, what it is precisely. And uh, the best hardness result It's again by some gadget reduction from Freesat or Freelin, or maybe from somewhere else. It's something like a, a 16 over 17. Maybe minus a little of one. This alpha is maybe 1.1 1 .1 something. Uh, point one uh, 0.87. Yeah, but uh, I choose the approximation as less than oh, one. Then it's point yeah, yeah. Seven. So you say point. Okay, I trust Avi on that. So I I it's some number, and the point is that this number <laughs> is different than this number. So we don't have a tight in approximability result. And again, the, this is the state of the art. And the question is, uh, how do you settle it? How do you prove tight in approximability results?
So it's not clear. <laughs> uh, but uh, one thing is clear that uh, the techniques that we have uh, that go with uh, the PCP theorem plus uh, the parallel repetition are not really sufficient. Uh, so for this two theorems, it is enough. There is a reason. This is really because uh, these problems are on three variables. This is three sat and this is three lin. If it was two sat or two lin, we'd be in bad shape. Uh, I'm sorry? No, we would not be able to prove it. <laughs> That's a... Uh, uh, so we need a stronger PCP theorem, which we don't know how to prove, but we know how to conjecture. <laughs> so this is something called uh, unique games. So let's define uh, what is a unique game. We'll have two equivalent definitions. Uh, so one definition is, so this is sort of, uh, so we are starting uh, the second task of getting more structured PCPs. Uh, so you look at uh, this label cover and you ask yourself, what is the best sort of structure that I can ask from the constraints? Uh, so clearly for each color of uh, U, I would have at least one color of V that's, uh, that satisfy the constraint. But maybe I have only one. Maybe this constraint is a permutation constraint. And this is the Unigames conjecture. Or the Unigames. So Unigame is label cover. Uh, where each constraint is a one-to-one -one mapping. also known as permutation. Good. <laughs> yeah, so Avi always uh, goes uh, two steps uh, <laughs> Yeah, so obviously it's into the future, but uh, let's do it slowly. Uh, so what can you say about unique games? So uh, what about uh, what about unique games between one and delta? So I give you a unique game. I promise you that either it's satisfiable or it's most delta satisfiable. What can you do? You can tell me if it's satisfiable. <laughs> Right, so checking if a unique game is satisfiable, this is easy because you, pro you use propagation, right? You take one vertex, you assign it some label, you deduce the neighbor's labels, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, easy. Yeah. So the unique game conjecture state that the next best thing happens. I want to say what. So again, uh, it has some relation to the new software paper. Actually, it was published, I think, in the same uh, journal, in the same uh, conference. But uh, let's state the conjecture. So it says that for every uh, delta greater than zero, there is some alphabet size k such that uh, unique games on alphabet size k between mine minus delta and delta is NP hard.
So examples of uh, unique games. So both examples were already said. <laughs> the first example is MaxCat. And uh, the second example is a sort of generalization of MaxCat called Toolin. So let's uh, define the problem. So again, we have a set of variables. But this time over large field, FQ. And we have a set of equations. But the equations involve only two variables. So they are the, of the form xi minus xj equals bij modulo q. So you can clearly see that tooling is a particular case of unique games, but it turns out that this is really equivalent to unique games. So, uh, uh, so tooling between one minus delta and delta, sort of the same in two directions as unique games. So this is a, in a paper, a nice paper by uh, Kurt Kindler, Moselle, and O'Donnell. Uh, we may discuss this, some of the results, a little more uh, closely. It's not literally the same, though. It's not there. Yeah, maybe a little different, though. For example. Maybe the parameter is different, but the point is that for every delta here, you can choose delta here and vice versa. Uh, So, so why care about unique games? Why? Uh, so it's a computational problem. Obviously, we would not know how to solve it efficiently, or if we cannot. But actually, this conjecture is a, I don't like the word, but it's deep. Let's call it that. Because uh, if you are willing to assume it, you get like tight in proximity results for whatever you'd like. So the first problem is vertex cover. So this is maybe one of the first demonstrations of uh, the power of unique games. This is by Cotton and Regev. Uh, they show that unique games conjecture implies that uh, two minus little of one harness. Okay, <laughs> I didn't state what the conjecture is. <laughs> oh, I, I did, I'm sorry. Sorry. So it said that uh, two minus little of one is NP hard uh, for vertex cover. And then uh, the next uh, big thing about uh, new games is that they imply that the gomez williams algorithm for MaxCut is optimal. So UGC, yeah. Uh, and after this paper, so I it's not that simple. So they needed some conjecture that was later proved by uh, Model Mo uh, Moselle or Daniel Uh Maybe you should just say that the uh, serious analytic techniques. Are we'll discuss it. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But after this uh, paper came out, people sort of realized that maybe unique games are very, very powerful, and maybe you can prove lots of inapproximability results. And indeed, this is the case. Uh, it's even worse, uh, in the sense that Pasad uh, Ragavenda he showed that for any CSP that you like, even slightly something more general. Yeah. Or label, yeah. For any CSP that you'd like, if you're willing to assume UGC, 
then here is a tight algorithm for it up to maybe epsilon. Yeah, and uh, this algorithm is uh, remarkable because it's some very generic algorithm. It's some SDP that you can construct for a problem without thinking for any s moment. And uh, sort of, uh, of course, it builds on the, all the previous ideas, in particular about this invariance principle that we may discuss, we may not. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so here there is uh, nothing to recover. <laughs> But here, uh, it's, it's really similar. They are uh, both SDP algorithms, and they both use geometric ideas to for the analysis. Good. Uh, so Just to make sure you mean tight arc by tight algorithm, you mean uh, an efficient algorithm? Efficient, efficient algorithm. Approximation ratio, which is, which is tight. Up to epsilon, yeah. Uh, okay, so. So Unigames is great. We, we'd like to prove it, but uh, we don't know how to do that. So there, also, so there were some attempts to do that. So it is known that Unigames is hard to approximate within any constant factor. But this really corresponds to having something small here and something even smaller there. So this is something that is known. And also, uh, it is known that if you put here 1 half and here uh, 3 over 8, then this is also hard. Uh, but this is still falls short of what we would like. So what we prove, so of course we don't uh, settle the conjecture, but uh, we make some step towards it. So, so here is the theorem that uh, is kind of the main uh, point of today. So for every epsilon greater than 0, uh, there is it some alphabet size k such that unique games of alphabet size k between half and epsilon is np harder. Yeah, so uh, this is a, uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so it's, uh, it's some papers, but uh, the set of offers are de novo. Uh, Court, Kindler, and Safa, uh, and also me. Uh, yeah, so this is a uh, one way to view our result, but I think that the more natural way, and maybe the way that uh, we'll see or partially see today, is uh, something about two to two games. Um, so, so there is also something called two-to-one games. This is a bipartite version of this uh, thing. We can also prove it there, but it's more convenient for me to talk about non-bipartite uh, problems. So what is a two-to-two game? Well, it's the same old label cover, but uh, each constraint is a two-to-two relation. Yeah, so they are, aligned, they are aligned in pairs 
So formally, you can write it as a, the union of uh, products, or uh, each AI and BI. And same goes for BI. So uh, don't worry about the formal definition. It's uh, two, two relation. Sorry. And you get half by just sampling. Yeah. So you can decompose any two two constraint into two unique constraints. So this is how you do that. Uh, so for two two games, the result says that for every epsilon greater than zero. There is some alphabet size k such that a uh, gap to the two games on alphabet size k is hard between 1 minus epsilon and epsilon. So any questions so far? Yeah. So is it easy to see that two teams are empty high? If it's one This? I'm sorry? So it's, it's not easy. Right? No, no. Mm. Even with, with uh, is it is it true that they're empty hard with uh, with some swan? Or complete swan? So it's not no no. It's still open. So uh, so th there is one good reason to ask. Can we take this one minus epsilon to be one? But so not just uh, ah. any I guess I would guess that this is hard, but I don't know how to. Gi I don't know actual reference. Uh, yeah. And this uh, two games is also equivalent to the now equations with two possibilities. Sort of, but it's more hairy to write it uh, precisely. But you can, but imprecisely, you can think of. Uh, but is so in precise, you can think of two to two game as x i minus f j is either b i j or b i j prime. Sort of, but uh, you need some coefficients. Yeah. So does this imply uh, somewhat tight and approximate? Great. <laughs> so. Uh, so I'll tell you what this implies. It implies something, but not as many things as UGC. And after that, we'll take a break. And in the second hour, we'll see a little bit about how how does one prove anything, like the PC, uh, basic Hassel results or this result. So it follows the same framework, but uh, introduce it. Uh, so some corollaries. So the first color corollary is for vertex cover. So vertex cover is how to approximate bit, uh, for factor square root of two, uh, which is an improvement of the new safra. The second one, which is kind of the same result, but it uh, it doesn't it doesn't this doesn't necessarily imply. The second one is that so uh, so I assume you all know the click problem. We have a graph, and we wish to find a subset of vertices such that the induced subgraph is a click. We want to find the largest click. Uh, so, square root two. So the second result says that uh, if I give you a graph and I promise you that either it contains a huge click 
a click of size 1 minus 1 over square root of 2. Or it contains a click of vanishing size at most epsilon. Then it's NPR to tell which one of the cases is it in. And also we have some uh, gap for uh, max cut. This is called, some called max cut gain. So it's, it's some gap for max cut, not the gap that you'd like, but something that was not uh, known before that. And uh, the last result is uh, for almost coloring. Uh, so this uh, problem is uh, as follows. So this problem is as follows. I give you a graph. And I promise you to you that it's almost four colorable, meaning I can take a set of one on this epsilon to the vertices and color them properly. And I ask you, please find an, a, a proper coloring of non-negligible size of the vertices using any am amount of colors, constantly many. So, uh, so the first is a promise and the second is a goal. Yeah. So. Uh, So uh, what we prove is that this is NP hard for any constant K. And uh, whatever, it's really just amount to finding an independent set in the graph. Um, so here is a, an important point where we'd like to have the perfect completeness, as, uh, as uh, was suggested. So the reason we have one minus epsilon here, as opposed to the proper coloring, is uh, because of this. And if we had a uh, one there, we'd have uh, a very good uh, uh, hardness result for coloring. Uh, just to give you some, uh, some comparison, So if you insist on getting a proper coloring, the best NPR result that is known is maybe five or six. Uh, maybe yeah, it's, it's, about, it's four, so maybe six, seven, I don't know. I'm not sure. Anyway, it's, it's some very small constant. Um, yeah, so any questions? So, so unlike the, the unique games case, the, the one to one, here perfect completeness is it's possible, and actually, it was conjectured with perfect completeness. Uh, uh, question, uh, uh, under UGC, the gap click, what is the best particular? Half. And this corresponds to having two here. I have a question about the best algorithm, but maybe just uh, since you didn't mention it, this unit games problem, uh, it also has an upper bound. I mean, there's an algorithm for it that is sort of weird and uh, it behaves different than NP-hard problems if it's NP-hard. 
a somewhat sub-exponential algorithm. But my question was is whether the same holds for two to two. Yeah. And yes, yeah. the same algorithm. I mean the same algorithm. You need to consider some variant of it by store, but okay. yeah, it essentially works as is. So as so, this is a good point. So if we expect unigames to be hard, then their complexity is it's not exponential, it's not polynomial, it's somewhere in between. It's some uh, 2 to the n to the epsilon. The epsilon is really epsilon Too many epsilons, yeah. <laughs> it's not the same epsilon, no. but... Uh, <laughs> related. Yeah, related. Uh, uh, but this is also always... Uh, this is already provable for 2 to 2 games or for any games between half an epsilon. Uh, so s sort of we have a candidate. Well, we don't have exponential time opposite, so it's not like a clean theorem, but yeah. So that means that you need some polynomial blow up in this reduction? Yeah. yeah, you need a large polynomial blow up. Can't, can't you run whatever this idea of Raghavendra is on, on, on your result? And this? Yeah. But this, do you mean write, run this algorithm? Something See, like you have some method to do this, right? So what happens if you try to use it? Yeah, okay. so actually, it was the other way around. Well, so, people around. <laughs> no, so people actually worked on unique games. They tried some SDP algorithms. Uh, they got better and better results, but of course never refuting it. This algorithm sort of generalizes them in some way. So... Uh, As you notice, you, the, the, the nice thing there is that to get the type, you know, the algorithm. If you don't, you know, if it doesn't succeed, it somehow provides you using any game with a certificate that that's the best one. Whereas in the, if you just look at the corollary, you see there is a gap between the best thing that's known and the, uh, you know, the best hardness and the best algorithm. I see. So, so if I get this correctly, the algorithm itself doesn't assume you see. No, no, no. It's not it, so the, the algorithm is fine. And the tightness is assuming you see. Precisely. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. The algorithm just gives you a number. It takes the nature of the, the complex expectation problem you have, produces the number, and for any instance, it will uh, give you this mass approximation, and you just see what that you, you cannot get at the moment. Yes. Does it, does it give anything new for Max Cut in terms of the evidence for constants? Or you really need to like Like to, to get to be over the 16 over 17? So I don't think or that. It or in the high value regime. Anyway. So it gives something for the high value regime. I, I don't precisely remember the parameters now, but it gives something. So it gives you the square root gap, or something like that. Yeah, but uh, for high values. Yeah. Uh, I hope I'm not misremembering. Uh, yeah, so we uh, we can uh, talk of after if you like. Any more questions? Sorry? Does it say anything about the classicity? Uh, in what sense? Uh, so, as your conjecture, like if UGC has a better than uh, sub exponential algorithm, which uh, it has right now, does it say anything about other classes? Well, it depends if it's NPR or not. If it did, then it would. Yeah. Uh, Maybe it's. <laughs> <Yeah. be. laughs> It's still possible, yeah. No, in the sense that you, there is a world in which you can solve UG, you could solve small set expansion, and nothing else. So it's not like uh, MP hardness in that sense. Yeah, it's still possible. But also, those are some of the most sophisticated algorithms for stuff we have. So yeah. it's really the business of proving that P is equal to MP. Uh, so, so we have this uh, PCP theorem plus uh, parallel petition, and our goal in life in this hour would, would be uh, to understand how one does prove further hardest results. For example, for freeling, three sat, and so on. So, uh, Uh, 
So there are two components to any PCP proof. proof. Uh, the first component is something called the outer PCP. <coughs> Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have this uh, typo a lot. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the outer PCP, because I had a typo, we'll not discuss it today. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so this is uh, some uh, NP-hard problem. Uh, like a, a label cover or variants of it. This is sort of a kind of the, mo the, the harder to explain part. Uh, if we have time, we'll discuss it, but uh, probably we'll not touch it today. And the second one is something called inner PCP. This is sort of something you can think about it independently. Uh, this is uh, something er about error correcting codes, about uh, local testing, local correcting, and things of that nature. Uh, so inner PCP is a uh, uh, coding theoretic object. Uh, and by that I mean we have some error correcting code C. And we have a local tester. Tau is a local randomized tester. Uh, so what does the word local mean? It means that it queries a given word at few locations. Hopefully. Wait, wait. Uh, so I'll say what the properties of the tester is. Just want to explain <laughs> word by word. So local means that we query the word at few locations. Randomize, randomize. And what does the tester mean? So we need two properties. So this tau is supposed to test whether a given word is a code word or far from being a code word. So the completion says that if we give it some proper code word, Then, when we run the tester on C, it accepts with high probability. And high here is usually just one. But uh, maybe 99% is good enough for some uh, applications. Uh, so what about the soundness? So we want to say that if we have some word that is far from being a code word, then the test rejects. But because we are dealing with low soundness, th this is sort of a unique decoding regime type statement. And because we want to deal with smaller soundness, we need to phrase it a little differently. Uh, so what we say is that uh, if uh, for some word w in sigma to the n, uh, So for, for every word in sigma to the n, if the tester passes uh, yeah. with non-negligible probability, so here we think about de delta is small constant then it means that W is uh, close to some proper code order. And uh, the word close here is uh, for two reasons. So usually this closes means that they have co some correlation or uh, that 
that the hemming weight between W and C is at most some um, one minus epsilon. So they, they agree on some coordinates. Well, you think about epsilon again as some constant. Uh, but we'll need something different. Uh, but for now, we, we can think about it uh, this way. So let's make some remarks. Yeah, so this is all you need for a PCP proof. You need outer PCP and a near PCP. Uh, but where does the problem that you want to provide us for come into play? <laughs> so uh, if we want uh, to prove uh, hardness uh, for predicate P, So for instance, in Tulin, the predicate is, is the difference of two variables zero? Or zero, or one, whatever, doesn't matter. For max cut is, are the two variables different? So if you want to prove hardness for this predicate P, what you need to care about is that the tester tau uses only predicates, uses only test of p. So this tells us this if you if we have some problem that we really like, we first need to think about some code and some tester that uses this po this predicate and uh, is able to achieve these two properties. Uh, but by itself, this is not enough. So by itself, it's not enough. So we'll, we'll see an example. We actually have a tester that is one-to-one -one tester. It has completeness and it has soundness, yet we don't know how to make uni, uni games out of it. And, and maybe a small remark. So this completeness and soundness, this really correspond to the right and the left of the gap that I always written. So this is a completeness one, this is soundness delta. So the test would have to have these two parameters. Good. Uh, so now I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, the inner PCPs, uh, about uh, some codes and some tests that people have thought about. And uh, Probably my favorite example is uh, this uh, thrilling example of Fastad, uh, where he used the predicate x plus y plus z equals zero to, to prove something. So let's see how does this fit into two. Uh, so this is, uh, so I need to tell you what is the code. So the code is the Hadamard code. And the test, the test is, uh, uh, the bloom lobby Rubenfeld linearity test. Uh, so let's define it. Uh, so what is the Hadamard code? So the Hadamard code is the collection of truth tables 
of linear functions from 0, 1 to then to 0, 1. Uh, so it's proof table of chi s, uh, where for any subset of n, we have a linear function chi s from 0, 1 to then to 0, 1, which is defined by chi s of x is equal to uh, the parity of uh, the bits of s of x. Or alternatively, you can look at it as inner product of x and the indicator function of s. Again, everything is modulo 2. Another way of saying it is uh, uh, all, binary, all binary vectors. Uh, yeah, the, the word proof table it may not be familiar, but it's just <laughs> the, the complete description of a function. So you evaluate this function phi as a chi mm. over all into vectors, and chi is just a linear function. Yeah, so, so as I said, so proof table is simply you take a function, you write it down all its values and all the points. This is the proof table. So good. Uh, so this is a well-known error correcting code. It, uh, you can ask about uh, its rate, its distance, and so on. No? But we don't care about any of that uh, for today. What we care about is how do we test locally that a given word is a code word or far from it. So a uh, given access to some function f, we need to test if it's a code word or file. Sorry? He's a person that introduced oh, this code apparently. Okay. Yeah, it's just a name. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the test of tau. So we want to test linearity using as few queries as possible. So what is the most obvious thing you, you can think of? Uh, so you sample x and y uniforming from 0, 1 to the n. And then you, you query f on three locations, x, y. But once you know the value of f on x and the value of f on y, because it's linear, you're supposed to know the value of f on x plus y. So you query, th you query that as well. And then you check if you have the obvious equation. You check if f of x plus y is equal to f of x plus f of y, but I'll write it in a funny way. OK, and uh, because this is f2, I can uh, even do something more funny can write a plus instead of a minus. And uh, this is my test. Okay. Uh, so three questions. Uh, what, what is this completeness? What about the soundness? And what does it have to do with PCPs? So completeness. So if f is a legitimate code word, then obviously this passes for any choice of x and y. Good. So what about the sameness? So let's see what, what we can hope for uh, without any structure. So suppose we sample a function f at random. What is the probability that for given x and y, it passes this test? 
Good. Well, this is half, right? Because this is a random variable getting the value 0 and 1 with equal probability. So the obvious thing that literally any function, not really, but in most functions pass this test with probability half. So the question is, what happens if you pass the test with prob more probability? Do you have any structure? So the sound says that uh, if, this is a true statement, if tau of f passes with probability half plus a little, then it is close to some code word. So closeness here is again, for every obvious reason it get half, so you get a little closer than that. Good. Um, so we have So here the alphabet is large. When it's small, you need to be a little more careful. <coughs> so uh, good. So what does it have to do with PCPs? So you can sort of imagine a truth table of a function as a set of variables, two to the n variables. For each point, you specify what is the value of the function on this point. And if you think about it this way, this is simply a, a linear equation with three variables. And uh, indeed, uh, what Astor did is he took this test and he made a PCP out of it. He used the, the sort of two properties to show that you can prove hardness for equations uh, modulo two with three variables. So if we have some time, but not enough time at the end of this talk, I'll, I'll maybe show you the proof. It's very cute, it's very, very nice. So this is a success story. You have a test, you have a code, and you made a, make a PCP out of it. Uh, but as I said, it's not automatic. It's not uh, always the case. So uh, the second example is the long code plus the noise test. So the other mode code has few code words uh, with relation to its length, but you can even ask for less. Uh, so the long code is, is a subcode. Uh, so long code So now you take the truth table of all dictators, of all characters of size one. Maybe. So for every coordinate, you have some function. The function is simply the dictatorship. It outputs this coordinate, always. Uh, good. So this is uh, the long code over field of size 2. Yeah, it's not if, I mean, you may relate the parameters uh, a little better. There, there are the number of possible s's, well, 2 to the n. Here mm. are 2 to the 2 to the n. So uh, depends on what your n is. So. Uh, so here D is a function from zero one to the end to yeah. zero one. Right. Yeah. Uh, so so again we have less code words with uh, respect to the length of the each code word. The length is the same in both. Yeah, the length is the same, but here you, you have n code words 
and there you have two to the n code words. Uh, yeah, log log. So, uh, so this is the, the long code over F2, but you, there is no reason to consider it over on, only over F2, and this is actually uh, what we'll do now. So this long code over F2 it has relation to this max catarnas that I talked about, but uh, we'll consider this over a larger field. Okay, so now we, we want to design a test that checks if a given word is a, is a long code word. So this is the noise test. Uh, so here is what you do. So you are given access to some f. And what you do is the following. You take x uniformly at random from the domain. And now you, for each coordinate, you flip it with probability small, with small probability, and otherwise you keep it the same. Very similar to the noise graph that we've seen last week. Okay, so for each coordinate, you resample it with probability half, uh, with probability epsilon, and otherwise you keep it the same. Okay. So let's see what's the what's the idea in uh, this test. So if we if f is indeed some uh, long code word, if it is indeed some dictatorship, what is the probability of passing this test? So what is uh, the answer? Yeah. So we only care about one coordinate in life, right? We only care about i. So whatever it does for other coordinates, we don't mind. But if for the certain i, we keep y i the same. <coughs> uh, OK, I didn't say the test. <laughs> so we sample uh, x and y, and then we check that f of x is equal to f of y. Okay, so again, if we have some dictatorship, it stays with the same value on x and y with probability at least one of exception. It is a little more because you can somehow, by chance, when you resample it, you get the same thing, but never mind. Uh, so this is great. So what about the soundness? Uh, so here is a, a statement that I leave a little vague. Uh, so if tau of f passes with uh, accepts, yeah. <laughs> maybe next time, <laughs> accepts with probability at least delta. Well, you think about delta as a small constant, but when q is going to infinity. So if it accepts with probability at least delta, then uh, f is uh, close to some di. But here, uh, the technical uh, term of closeness is not Hamming distance. Uh, for those of you familiar with influences and things like that, this uh, means that, uh, uh, that there exists some i such that uh, 
the inference on, of i on f is large. Uh, but you even need something stronger than that. You need something called noisy influence or low degree influence. But uh, this is good enough for us. OK, so this is a one-to-one -one test, right? You just check if two variables get the same value. And it has good completeness and good soundness. Yet we don't know how to make a PCB out of it. If we knew, we'd get unique games that we don't know. So this example was just to show you that this switch is not automatic from a, an actual inner PCB that works and some coding thing. It's, uh, it's not something that so easy to state. When does it work and when does it not? And uh, may, uh, maybe I'll say it uh, briefly, that part of the success of unique games is that if you're willing to assume unique games, all you really need is such a test. If you have such a test for some code, you automatically get NP-harness. This sort of was the observation of uh, the KKMO paper, at least partially. Sorry? It's not an if and only if you can like go to the best approximation that you uh assume you should see uh uh you obtain if the if and only if there's a, a code with a specific code. So actually you can. <laughs> this is what Ragavendra did. Oh. He, sh he showed that uh, he showed some, uh, some SDP algorithm that if you show an integrality gap for it, namely you show that it doesn't work, then you can make some long code test out of it. It's a very nice uh, result. But it's, uh, not, it's not very simple, but conceptually, this is what he's saying. Uh, good. So we've seen something that works, something that doesn't work, and now something that uh, hopefully works. Uh, so this is the code that we're using. Uh, so we're using something called the Grassman code. I'll shortly define it. I'll show you. To, to, to test on it, but uh, again, I want to say that there were previous to, to test that were known to work, there were even one-to-one -one tests, but sort of the point here is that you can make a PCB out of it. It's not just uh, some coding theory. Uh, okay, so uh, let's define this code. Uh, so a quick reminder of what a Grassmann graph is. So we have some vector space V. Over F2. And L, we think about it as much smaller the dimension of V. So the vertices of the graph are all L-dimensional subspaces. And the edges so you connect two subspaces at an end prime by an edge if they intersect in dimension L minus one. So we have the graph. Now we'll define the code and then the test. Uh, so in the long code, we are trying to encode a coordinate. In the Hadamard code, we try to encode a subset of 
uh, a linear function. So in the Gaussman code, we try to encode a linear function as well. And we do that by writing down the restrictions of f to all of the vertices of the graph. Okay, so uh, you can think about it as a as a vector of symbols from two to the l, right? So writing down a linear function on n dimensional space over F2 is some, is some vector over 2 to the L uh, to the number of vertices. Okay, so in other words. You can write it by just L, but yeah. if you want. Ye yeah, but okay, sorry. But for, for each value, I need uh, one symbol, 0, 1. Yeah, so, yeah, so this is. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So the, the alphabet size is 2 to the L. Um, okay. So in different words, instead of writing down the truth table, instead of writing down F on every single point, we write F down on every single subspace. Sort of a generalization of what a truth table is. So we're halfway there, we have the code. Now we need to define the test. So, so, so yeah, the test is uh, very simple, right? To write down the encoding, we use the vertices. So for the test, we'll use the edges. So. What do you expect from an edge? If you take an edge, read the value of L and the value of L prime, you expect these two values to be consistent, at least on the intersection of L and prime. This is exactly the test. Okay, so again, we get some word. And we want to test if it's close to a code or, or not. So what we do, we sample an edge L and prime. Uh, we, re we read or query uh, this word on the L coordinate and coordinate L prime, and uh, check consistency. on the intersection. So here is maybe a picture. We have this L, and we have this L prime. And we want to test if they agree on the intersection. So now we need to discuss three points. First, completeness, then why this is a two-to test, and lastly, the more difficult question is about soundness. So let's begin with completeness. So what happens if capital F is really a legitimate code word? Of course, it passes, right? It's the same function.
गुड सेकेंडली वाई इज दिस टू 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 टेस्ट सो लेट्स फिक्स वन एज एंड सी हाउ द अग्रीमेंट्स आर आई नो सो क्लियरली देव टू वर्क देव टू बी कंसिस्टेंट इन दिस पार्ट राइट सो देर हेज टू बी सम लिनियर फंक्शन ऑन एल माइनस वन डोमेंशन हाउ मेनी चॉइसिस डू आई हैव टू एक्सटेंड इट टू एल वेल हैव ओनली वन बोर डोमेंशन and i have i can give it the value 0 or value 1 so we have two extensions and the same goes for the red one we have two extensions here as well so this is why this is 2 to 2 good so what about sums Uh, so just to spell it out, we have some f. We know that the test accepts every probability, some small constant. What do you say about f? So ideally, what you you'd like. to conjecture <laughs> or at least the first guess that one may have So this is the simplest thing you can ask for. Does it mean that f is closed, at least correlated, with some actual code word g? And uh, anyone wants to take a guess? I told you that no. <laughs> so this is false. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll prove this fact by a picture. <laughs> So uh, here is a recipe for So here is a recipe for counter examples. So like any recipe we have some ingredients and the ingredients here are non expanding sets. So uh, we want to have S1 to SM disjoint sets of vertices. Uh, such that they are all small. To yeah, and is the number of vertices in the graph. Uh, the second property is that together they do cover a lot of the graph. And the last property is that they have weak expansion. And just to remind you what ex expansion is, so we look at the set SI, and we look at all the edges that touch it, and expansion measures the ratio between the number of edges that go outside Uh, by the total number of edges 
that are inside uh, the touch S. So expansion is uh, it's the blue divided by the total. Okay, so what it says is that some edges, at each delta of them, stay inside SI. Okay, so, so let's draw this picture and make a counter example. Uh, so we have our graph and we have our sets S1, S2, and so on. And now I claim that we can construct some word F that passes the test with probability roughly delta, but yet it is not correlated with any code word. At least the correlation is little of one. And the way to do that is for each piece, for each SI, pick some linear function randomly. Then what you do, vertices inside SI, you assign by their function. So f of L. So if L is covered by this, by SI, it is simply the restriction of the function f, uh, Fi to L. And if L is not covered, we don't really care. Put it arbitrarily or uh, randomly. Okay. Now I claim two things. First of all, this function passes the test with probability roughly delta. So let's see that. So S1 to Sm, they cover constant function of the vertices. So they co cover also a construction of the edges. It's not trivial, but uh, it, uh, it is true. So a construction of the edges touch some SI, but delta of each edge that touch SI stays inside. So we have that delta fraction of the edges look like that. They stay inside some S set. And whenever this is the case, the test passes on this edge because it's the same function. Good, so, so F passes the test with high probability or with non negligible probability, but yet you can see that F has no correlation with any global function. And this is because each set is small. So this would be candidates, but they only correlate on SI. And any other candidate has no real hope. Anything that is outside this list, there's no hope. So this is an issue. And it says that if you want to understand the soundness of the test better, or at least make some, some conjecture about it, you first need to understand how does small, set ex small sets that don't expand look like. This is, was the subject of last week. We saw something along these lines. Uh, so let me write it.
Uh, so that we realized, and we were hoping that once we answer this question, we'll be smarter, hopefully, to answer this seemingly more difficult question. <laughs> but it turns out that uh, it's equivalent. So this is a beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful argument by Barak Kotharin Storer. So uh, proving uh, structure of this type implies uh, some uh, or the desired sound notion. Okay. No, so uh, I can show it. It's very simple. It's uh, like ten minutes. Uh, but I want first to tell you what does the soundness actually look like. So in the paper, we state it as an hypothesis because we didn't know how to prove it. Uh, but now it's a theorem, so why not? Uh, the theorem says that uh, for every delta greater than 0, there, there exists some epsilon greater than 0 in R, such that the following holds. Uh, if we have some assignment to the vertices, by linear functions uh, that passes the test. Then it has some global structure, but not in an obvious sense. Then there are some subspaces, Q and W. The dimension of Q is small. The co-dimension of W is small as well. And some function. And a linear function f from both V to F2 such that if you restrict your view to the vertices of the graph that contain Q and are containing W, then inside this set, F does have global structure. So this is uh, the soundness that we can hope for from the Gaston test. This is actually like the, the correct thing. And uh, we don't have uh, any more time left, but uh, now the task is uh, given this type of soundness, you need to make a PCP out of it. And it's, uh, it's not a trivial task. And uh, so secondly, we need uh, to prove that these two things are equivalent. So if I had uh, 10 more minutes, I would do that, but uh, I don't. And uh, yeah, so any questions? But uh, maybe you can say uh, uh, not about the yeah. You know, so there's a proof of this. It's that it's not difficult. Yeah. Uh, it's an iterative argument, but um, you know, to to do to make a PCP out of this or of any of the code tests, you know, what are the high level steps that are needed? Maybe why the noisy test fails or some, some hint as to what? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I, I, no. I, try, I try to think about it. Like, uh, maybe if I had another half an hour, I would. Uh <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to do that, so I think that the, the best way to do it is like to see why 
you need games imply harness results. So this is like the simplest thing, taking a test and making a PCP out of it. But then when you cannot assume unique games, when you assume only label cover, it gets more difficult. And because uh, oh, sort of uh, the basic task that we have is uh, we have some vertex in our label cover, and we want to give it uh, some encoding from the alphabet. But we want to encode this alphabet differently. And we want to test both the constraint and uh, the validity of the encoding efficiently. And the way these things go is, OK, I want to encode some symbol from sigma. I'm going to use the long code, for example. So instead of writing down a ver one vertex u, I'm going to write down a bunch of vertices. And when I want to give u the assignment little sigma, I'll think about it as the dictator of sigma. OK, and then, uh, then it starts getting more difficult. So we have these supposed assignments to the long code of u of the long code of v. We want to test that the constraint is satisfied. And also we want to test that this is an actual dictator using noise test or something like that. Uh, so this is a test. Uh, so this is uh, the place where these tests are used. But as I said, it's, it's not trivial like to OK, so the difficult part is taking two long codes and making sure that they are consistent, that they pass the constraint. Uh, but if you don't want to think about that, you only want to think about the validity of your encoding, then this is something that we've already done. And most of the harness is this correlating the long code of U and the long code of V. So this is like the one minute version of uh, what Avi wants, but <laughs> for uh, Care. I mean, I think in general, with this uh, coding view of the inner PCP, is the, is the internal consistency of encoding one vertex. Yeah. And another part has to go to a test the test consistency of, I mean, test the constraint. Yeah. And maybe I'll say one more, one more word about why Unigames allows you to, to prove harder, uh, to prove some stronger things. So the point in Unigames is that this is actually a picture. The long code of V and the long code of U are the same. They are isomorphic. So whenever you have a test that makes two queries here, you can sort of say, OK, I'll take one query here. And the second query I'll take here under this isomorphism. And this makes life very, very nice. Uh, but when these long codes are not isomorphic, it gets difficult. And this is the outer PCP that I promised not to speak about, and yet I'm saying something about it. <laughs> uh, any more questions? Yes. Is there any hope for like one and a half by one and a half type of test? Uh, so sometimes you are forced, but sometimes you are. Yeah. So I don't know. So uh, you need to come up with some something, uh, some some other code that has this property. Uh, but then you'd need to to bypass this issue as well. So the short answer is that I don't know, but maybe. Uh. All right, thanks.